Ladies and gentlemen, I feel semi-guilty for breaking up your conversations at your table, but if I could have your attention, please. Please do continue to eat your meal if you're not yet done with it. I want to affirm that we at Tamas place high priority on food, so please uh, do continue with your dinner. But I'd like to have your attention, if I may have it, so that we can proceed with our program and pay uh, honor to the uh, O'Donnell Award recipients. Once again, welcome to the 2019 O'Donnell Awards Dinner. We want to again thank our conference sponsors with a special acknowledgement to our platinum sponsor, the Oscar Fisher Project. We'd also like to thank our diamond sponsors, Texas A&M University, and a joint sponsorship from UT Southwestern Medical Center of Dallas and Southwestern Medical Foundation. We also had uh, several uh, gold and silver, silver letter level sponsors, and we are extremely grateful to all of our sponsors. Uh, I think it should be obvious that we would not be able to do this were it not for our sponsors. So let us thank our sponsors. We would also uh, like to pay particular tribute to the sponsors of the O'Donnell Endowment who are in attendance today. The endowment makes the O'Donnell Awards possible and are critical, obviously, again, to uh, the O'Donnell Award program. I'd like to uh, recognize several people, and as I recognize you and will follow this pattern for the next several minutes, we're going to be totally organized and together as a team here at Tamist and this dinner, unlike Washington, D.C. And as a team, we'll hold our applause uh, until we recognize certain groups of people. So the first group I'd like to recognize are the contributors to the O'Donnell Endowment. So if I, when I call your name, please stand but hold your applause to the end. Kathleen Gibson with the Southwestern Medical Foundation. Where are you, Kathleen? Hold your applause. Teamwork, teamwork. Hold that applause. Jeff Kodosky, the uh, Kodosky Foundation, please stand, and James Truchard uh, of National Instruments. Thank you so much for supporting the endowment. We have several past Tamas presidents in endowment, and by the same pattern, if you'll call when I arise, rather when I call your name, uh, let's hold our, hold our applause to the end. Uh, Ken Arnold, please stand. Lynn Draper. Tinsley Oden, and finally Don Paul. Thank you, past presidents. We have a couple of university presidents uh, in attendance tonight, and I'd also like you to do the same thing. Rise, please, when I call your name. Dr. Daniel Podolsky, president of UT Southwestern Medical Center, and Dr. Richard Benson, president of the University of Texas at Dallas. Thank you for your support and attendance. We have two very special people, Nobel laureates in attendance tonight, Dr. Robert Curl of Rice University and Dr. Johann Dysenhofer of UT Southwestern Medical Center. Thank you for taking time to join us. Past O'Donnell Award recipients in attendance, I'd like to ask you to arise, please. Elaine Lee from UT Austin. David Mangelsdorf from UT Southwestern Medical Center. Tony, who has some real friendships formed at that table. Tony uh, Mikos at Rice University. Kim Orth of UT Southwestern Medical Center. And James Walker of Southwest Research Institute. Thank you so much for joining us. The Edith and Peter O'Donnell Awards annually recognize rising Texas researchers who are addressing the essential role that science, engineering, medicine, and technology play in society and whose work meets the highest standards of exemplary professional performance, creativity, and resourcefulness. The awards represent a way to recognize young people at a critical stage in their career and raise the profile of what's being done in our beloved state of Texas. Since inception, seven O'Donnell Award recipients have been inducted into one of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, or Medicine. Wow, seven past O'Donnell Award winners went on to become National Academy members. Named in honor of Peter and Edith O'Donnell, 
who are among Texas's staunchest advocates for excellence in scientific achievement and STEM education, the awards showcase the best and brightest in Texas research and people whose creative work could have a lasting impact on our lives. Each O'Donnell Award recipient will be introduced by a video highlighting their work to be followed by remarks by their nominator and then by remarks from each award recipient. So let's get going. The first to be recognized is Dr. Ralph DeBardinas, the recipient of the 2019 Edith and Peter O'Donnell Award in Medicine. Dr. DeBardinas is Chief of the Division of Pediatric Genetics and Metabolism at UT Southwestern Medical Center and the Director of the Genetic and Metabolic Disease Program at Children's Medical Center Research Institute at UT Southwestern. Let's watch the video and learn more about him and his work. I've taken care of thousands of sick children throughout my career, and so, you know, having a healthy daughter who's in first grade now just really makes you appreciate what you have and it really makes us work harder and harder to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to help the kids that need help. We study the role of metabolic alteration in disease. We think that many, many diseases are caused by changes in metabolism that interfere with the organs in the body carrying out their normal function. Our team studies how tumor metabolism works or how cancer feeds itself. Which nutrients do they use? How do they use it? And is there anything different than normal tissue? Can we distinguish them somehow? The dogma for most of the last 100 years is that uh, glucose is the major fuel for the tumor and the mandatory waste product is lactic acid. What we observed as we started analyzing metabolism directly in tumors as they were growing in patients was that you couldn't explain the metabolic patterns with that old dogma. We had to account for the fact that there was lactate moving into the tumor and contributing to the metabolites that produce energy, presumably for growth. If you could capitalize on the fact that lactate moves into the tumor to design, uh, for example, uh, an imaging tracer, maybe that would provide predictive uh, information about which tumors are most likely to be aggressive in the patient, and that might influence the way we treated the patient. Ralph is a leader in the area of cancer metabolism. His work is changing the way we think about metabolism in cancer cells and yielding new strategies for treating disease. By better understanding their metabolism, Ralph's research reveals new strategies for treating cancer. I think the goal here is to do research in the lab that can help as many people as possible down the road, right? And sometimes we do that in small increments and sometimes we do that in really big discoveries. Seeing patients in the clinic really keeps the work that we do in the lab uh, grounded. Right, make sure that we're asking the right questions. We're interested in biology, we're interested in the biology of disease, but ultimately what we're interested in is taking that biology and using it as a way to develop new treatments. The ultimate test for this program will be being able to develop a new treatment for a disease that did not previously have a treatment. Every time we go through um, another series of patients, we're honing the approach and making it more instructive. And so I'm proud of what we've accomplished so far, but I'm really excited about what we're gonna see over the next five to 10 years. Ralph's nominator was Dr. Sean Morrison, who is with us tonight, and I'd invite him to the podium to make some remarks about Dr. DeBarsavis. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to um, um, recognize Ralph's award tonight. Ralph is not only, Ralph is a friend, a collaborator, and uh, obviously an important colleague. Ralph is a rare example of a physician scientist who not only is an innovator in the clinic, but also is a leading basic scientist. Um, clinically, he's the director of our genetic and metabolic disease program, which is improving the way that kids with inborn errors of metabolism are diagnosed because families that show up in Ralph's clinic at Children's Medical Center in Dallas with evidence of an inborn error of metabolism that can't be diagnosed with existing clinical tests, Ralph sequences people in the family to try to identify the genetic basis for the 
metabolic error, but he's also developing the ability to introduce metabolomics into the clinic, to develop far more detailed metabolic fingerprints to understand what's really going wrong at a molecular level in these kids. And we expect that that's going to improve our ability to treat kids with, um, with so far undiagnosed disease. But beyond those clinical efforts, he's also an international leader in the area of cancer metabolism where his laboratory has changed the way we think about metabolism. You, many of you probably heard him speak this afternoon, and as was evident from that uh, video, one of the dominant ideas in the area of cancer metabolism for the last 100 years has been the idea that cancer cells metabolize glucose to lactate, and they shut down their mitochondria, or they suppress mitochondrial function. Um, but that idea is largely based on growing cancer cells in laboratory dishes where glucose concentrations are essentially unlimited. And it's not like that, Ralph has found, in real tumors growing in vivo. And whereas many of us uh, have innovated by looking in vivo, studying tumors, human tumors or mouse tumors that are growing in mice, um, Ralph is actually doing it in real humans where he's infusing them intraoperatively with carbon-13 labeled metabolites so that when the tumor gets resected, um, his laboratory is able to take a sample of the tumor and then trace those labeled carbon molecules through the tumor. And in so doing, they've realized that carbon is sufficiently limited in real tumors in vivo that uh, the ca this cancer cells can't afford to give up the lactate after fermenting glucose and that instead they're having, in most cancers, they're metabolizing that through their mitochondria. So this is changing the way we think about cancer metabolism, and it's, uh, it's suggesting new strategies and new potential metabolic vulnerabilities in the cancer cells. Uh, so this is obviously important work, and um, uh, we started Children's Research Institute seven years ago, um, where we focus at the interface of stem cells, cancer, metabolism, and one of the key decisions was to build the institute partly around Ralph and his research. And the thing that for me personally is most um, um, satisfying about all of this is that before we started the institute, you know, thinking about what you want the institute to be, I want it to be a, a, um, a collaborative place, kind of place where people um, like working with each other and people are excited about doing things together. And so you have to recruit the right kind of people to really make that kind of an environment a reality. And um, one of the uh, best things that I did uh, starting as director of the institute was to have Ralph come and help start the institute with me, moving over into the institute from the pediatrics department at UT Southwestern. Because Ralph has exactly the right kind of personality, not only to inspire people to come from other places, to the institute to work with him, but also to create the right kind of culture in the institute to make it the kind of collaborative place that I envisioned it would be. So um, congratulations, Ralph, uh, and thanks for everything that you do. And now I ask Dr. De Debradinas to come forward, and we're going to put a medallion on him to celebrate the award. See if I can do this semi-gracefully. It is heavy. <laughs> that is heavy. <clears throat> and this is your chance to share your remarks. Thanks very much. Um, well, I, I first want to thank uh, Tamist. Um, and also the O'Donnell family and the O'Donnell Endowment for um, their support of uh, young scientists. And I, even more than that, I want to thank them for considering me to be a young scientist. I think <laughs> <laughs> the clock is really ticking. Um, this is a phenomenal uh, award and phenomenal night. I'm, I'm really appreciative. Thanks also to the selection committee for, uh, for highlighting our work. Um, I want to thank my nominator, Sean Morrison, um, for his uh, continued uh, support and encouragement over the years, and for also being a just phenomenal scientific colleague and friend and collaborator. 
um, when Sean started the Institute and um, was uh, recruiting me, he said, you know, I want uh, the scientists at the Institute to do uh, things that are risky. Uh, I want us to take risks, but, um, you know, I want the risks to have the potential to pay off in terms of the way we think about disease, maybe the way we treat patients. And if you're a physician scientist like me, I mean, that's just exactly what you want to hear. So that was a very easy decision. And uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, I want to thank my lab, uh, the people who do all the work, the technical staff, the grad students, the, the postdocs who have um, as much passion about these projects as I do. It's just, um, it's just great, and I wish every one of them could be here tonight. I also want to thank our clinical collaborators. Our work is highly collaborative, and, um, and it involves uh, partnerships with medical geneticists and pediatricians and surgeons and oncologists and radiologists, and um, you know, none of the human work would be possible with all, uh, without all of those partners. Um, and I want to thank uh, our patients um, and, um, and their families for uh, volunteering to participate in these studies, some of which are invasive. Um, but uh, I am uh, eternally grateful that they've um, put faith in us that, that what comes out of these studies might potentially have use, even though we tell them that it's not going to affect the way we treat their cancer and it's not going to affect their, their chances of, uh, of a cure. Um, really, they're working for, um, for future generations, um, as are we. So I'm, I'm eternally grateful. And then finally, uh, most importantly, I want to thank my family, uh, my daughter Nadine, and my wife, especially my wife Donna. Uh, you can tell already they're a lot more photogenic than I am. Uh, thank you um, for reminding me every day what's really important, and then for being patient with me when I forget every day. Thank you. Thank you. Our next award is the O'Donnell Award in Engineering. And let's uh, look at the video. Dr. Hal Op Op Alper <laughs> is the uh, recipient of the award. He is the Associate Chair and Paul D. and Betty Robertson Meek Centennial Professor in Chemical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. The video now, please. <laughs> I think of the kitchen kind of as the chemistry lab that we've been working on for thousands of years. In any given day, we may repeat the same process, or we may try to experiment with the ingredients that we have, or we may try to just see if we can do something brand new. And that's not dissimilar at all from the type of research that we do. Most current processes really start from petroleum. And that's the starting point of finding that carbon for the overall production. Our processes can differ from that. We use biomass as the carbon source, things like plastic waste to other types of things that are thrown away. And our process would use those as the carbon source and convert them into our new product. I got really excited about this idea of using yeast um, to create um, a variety of chemicals that we need for our daily life in a way that is renewable. We're interested in making these in a very sustainable way, using cells like yeast and bacteria to be able to produce these molecules that we use. The same way that yeast, for example, has been used to make alcohol, so the ethanol that we have in our beer and wine, we can then convert that yeast cell away from making ethanol and into a new type of molecule, like a plastic or a drug. One of the most interesting things that we've developed within our lab is the ability to rewire cells pretty generically. And this is a tool and approach that we're using for a variety of different products, for a variety of different applications. But it's really the systematic approach of how we can go in, change how metabolism works, change how gene expression works, to be able to make the product an outcome that we want. One of the things that I actually recently worked on was making omega-3 fatty acids in our yeast. And so then that's something we can add into our diets, um, either directly we can take those as supplements, um, or we can feed the yeast to other organisms as food. What he is developing, what he is doing right now with his metabolic techniques is not just for drugs and bioplastics. Maybe new chemicals that can be designed that way. He is the right person at the right time. Long-term success of this type of research area 
really reduces the pollution that we create in the chemical industry. It reduces the waste and it reuses the waste so that we're no longer dependent upon all these resources that we have to drill out of the land. And instead, we can actually live in a sustainable manner with all the types of materials that we use. Going forward and seeing the applications of what engineers can actually do, what engineers can create, and what new solutions engineers can find, it's become an inspiration. It's become the thing that gets me up every day really looking forward to solving the world's problems. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Nicholas Pepys, his nominator, to come forward and make remarks. Every time I come to this podium to introduce a new winner of the O'Donnell Award, I'm proud. I'm proud I'm a Texan. I'm proud I'm an engineer. I'm proud I'm a citizen of this country. Because the reason we are here the reason this Texas community, this Texas Academy exists is because we help people, because we help patients, because we help the citizens of this country, of this state, and this country, and the world. Presenting Hal Alper reminds me of the 1947 Nobel laureate uh, who said uh, in literature, who said, you cannot, leave, you cannot discover something new unless you leave a shore for a long period of time. And Hal has taught us how to do that. He has taught us to do that with grace, with scholarship, with dedication to people, with dedication to students, and at the same time with dedication to the environment where he works, to the broader environment of the state, the country, and the world. Hal is a native of Maryland, and he went to undergraduate school at the University of Maryland in chemical engineering, and then he went to MIT in 2002, where he worked with this great metabolic engineer scientist, a very good friend of mine, another Greek, I have to say, <laughs> Greg Stephanopoulos. And he really flourished in that laboratory. And he started developing really a series of techniques that became the basis of modern metabolic engineering. In fact, Greg told me to remind everybody that Hal is the reason why Greg has so many citations <laughs> in his work. And in 2006, he started a postdoc experience. Parenthetically, it was in Boston that he met his dear wife, Lauren. And in 2006, he started a postdoctoral experience, and in 2008, we got him at the University of Texas, where in a few years, he taught us perseverance, first-rate work, scholarship. One of his early mentors was George Giorgio, that many of you know, another member of several academies. And uh, together, they started designing something new. And that something new is to control the cell and the metabolic process in order to direct it to create something new. The basic idea had been built 30 years earlier, 40 years earlier, with some true pioneers. It was repeated much later. And of course, those of you who attended his talk today, you heard the work, the word directed evolution. And I'm pretty sure that reminded you of Francis Arnold, who is another one of his mentors, the Nobel laureate in chemistry this year. He started working with his students. He created an incredible group, and he started being recognized throughout the world. He's only 38 years old. He has been recognized by election to the National Academy of Inventors, by election to receive the Alan P. Colburn Award, which is the highest recognition a chemical engineer can receive in the country. I would say 90% of the Colburn recipients become members of the National Academy of Engineering. He has received a large number of awards, like the Danny, uh, the Danny Wang Award and the Jay Bailey Award for various journals. And he's, in fact, nominated this year for a few others that we are waiting to hear about. But that doesn't tell you much about the man. He works all the time with students. 
he tries to really come up with synthetic biology as an integral part of engineering. And he is one of the leaders in that field in the country, in the world. In fact, he has received world awards. He is a visiting professor in a Chinese university, something that you don't really get at this young age. But let me tell you about another Hal. That's the Hal who cares about people, who cares about his environment. Hal will spend all his time in the corridors, on the phone, when we drive home or whenever, talking about how we can build a better department, a better school, a better university, how we can increase the scholarship, how our students can be best. Right now, the chemical engineering department at the University of Texas at Austin is number four in the country in undergraduate education. And I can tell you in all honesty that one of the main reasons is Hal and a few other young investigators, several of whom have received this award in the past years. Last year's recipient, Delia Milayron, was another one from chemical engineering in the same place, because of their belief in the students and the people. And Hal continues, without being asked, he became uh, involved with the graduate school and became the chair of the graduate school assembly. Can you imagine? This is a scientist who has 15, 20, 25 people in his laboratory who gets, has gotten more than $20 million in research, who is associate editor of Metabolic Engineering, a very important journal in the field, who is, was chairman of the section of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and continues to do that. And that's why I admire him. I admire him because he is in a unique breed of which we don't have many. Thank God we have a few more at UT, but we don't have really many people who give from their life. The only time I cannot call him is Friday evening, Saturday morning, he is with Laura and the kids, <laughs> with Sarah and Ian. But most of the time I can call him and we can talk about something. Let me tell you about one last thing, as if that was not enough. He's a great teacher. He has taught several thousands of students. Hal, being a great researcher, is not somebody who goes and teaches 20 students and tries to avoid teaching. In, to some extent, he reminds me of another dear colleague of mine, Grant Wilson, who is in the audience and who will be a little bit upset that I'm saying it in public, who still teaches organic chemistry to sophomores. And this is a man who is a major figure in the field. The same thing with Hal. He doesn't worry teaching. His scores are 4.7, 4.8, 4.9. And a few years ago, in 2012, I think, he received the Regents Teaching Award. Now, those of you who are at the UT system, you know what the Regents Teaching Award means. It's really the highest teaching recognition in the field. You're talking about somebody who still talks to the people in a plain level, but at the same time attracts a lot of industry to work with him, has several patents, the Office of Technology Commercialization, the one likes him. That's why last year we gave him the Young, Investig the Young Inventor Award of the Year of UT Austin. And as I said, this year we elected him to the Academy of Inventors. Uh, that's all I can say except to remind you that he follows a tremendous tradition. Four of the recipients of this award in engineering have gone on to become members of the National Academy of Engineering. One of them actually is double. Tony Mikus became National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine. And uh, I would like to introduce to you my good friend, Hal Alper. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Nicholas. I'm not sure how to quite follow that up, <laughs> but I will try nevertheless. Um, well, first off, I want to thank the O'Donnell Foundation and Tamist, and especially Nicholas Pepys as a great friend and colleague to be the nominator for this award. It's a great honor to both receive it and to be respected enough to even be put up for this. So I thank you very much for, for that nomination and the friendship that you have. Um, as well as the number of people who have written the nomination letters and gone through the process with me. And 
You know, earlier today, I got a chance to showcase the, exactly the science that we do and kind of what excites me on a day-to-day -day basis. And I get a few minutes here to be able to talk a little bit about the broader context, and that is really the people, the people that have both impacted and shaped the way in which I think about things and the people who actually get to implement the ideas and technologies that we have. And to some extent, science is, is really becoming about becoming an expert in the field, but you always come back and keep questioning, how can you improve things? How can you invent something different? How can you arrive at a new place and have more knowledge than you started? And how can you get students to become well adapted to be able to answer the new questions of the day? And it's a process, just like as with life. And um, we don't do this alone, and which is kind of for a fortunate thing. Um, so I've had a lot of people who I want to think that have been along this road of exploration, both in the past and, and currently. And first and foremost, um, we'll start with a family. Um, from the beginning, my parents and my sisters for putting up with someone who was exploring science and was um, really interested in that, oftentimes when they weren't, and they feigned quite a bit of interest in it. Um, and then moving on to um, the people who are here to um, support, who sometimes also probably feign interest in the science that I bring up oftentimes, uh, my wife Lauren, uh, my daughter Sarah, and son Ian, um, for being here and always supportive and understanding and hopefully getting a little bit of science knowledge along the way. Um, and then the, throughout my education, a number of different mentors um, that Nicholas had mentioned at University of Maryland College Park, um, I got a chance to give, be given an opportunity to do undergraduate research with Nam Sun Wong, who incidentally was one of the first uh, graduate students of my um, former, uh, my, uh, former PhD advisor, um, Greg Stephanopoulos. So it's kind of an interesting academic tree that's kind of a little uh, mixed roots underneath of it. Um, and then I went to MIT and um, had the opportunity to work with Greg Stephanopoulos, who was a great mentor and taught me a lot about metabolic engineering and cellular engineering, and then went on to a postdoc um, with Jerry Fink at the Whitehead Institute, as well as um, at Shire Human Genetic Therapies, where I had a couple of people who I, I worked with. And then I moved on and, and started finding a faculty position when I was finishing up my PhD, and really grateful to UT for um, both having a thought that had in faith in me and selecting me to be a faculty member here, I knew um, it was a great connection from the start, um, which is one reason why I was um, absolutely thrilled to come to UT and to Texas. Um, and I knew I would have great colleagues, and in fact, Nicholas would, would be one of those that, that befriended me very early on, um, even before Google notifications and Google Scholar, um, I had received an email from him within an hour or so of my paper appearing on Science. Uh, magazine, and it was just impressive how he was able to just get well connected even before the era of being well connected. Um, so I knew I was, was in the right place um, at that point in time. And at that time, also the uh, department chair, Roger Bonnekes, um, who had hired me, and current department chair with a lot of support with Tom Truskitz. Um, I had a former dean, now president of the university, who um, put a lot of faith in me, um, was Greg Fenvis, and also our current dean, Sharon Wood. For, uh, very thankful for her to come out today. Um, as well as the rest of uh, the few people in the department who are here, who are members of TAMIST, as well as those who um, weren't able to come. And then finally, getting the work done is really the effort of a lot of students. And I mentioned um, during my presentation, and I can't mention every single person's name since there were over 80 um, undergraduate researchers that we've had in the lab, 25 graduate students, uh, three postdocs, and two visiting scientists. And really, I consider what I do one of the the best positions that you can have in the world, really. You get a chance to really push people, shape the future, and, and train students. And really, that's one of the central goals as an educator, is being able to train and shape the future. And I really value that, both in the classroom as well as in the lab. And really just honored to be able to have that opportunity each and every day um, in my work. And so finally, just really like to thank UT again and, and Texas for all the opportunities that it's been able to provide. And I look forward to being able to continue, um, hopefully very successfully, going on in the future, especially with the types of students and resources that we have at UT. So thank you very much. And Nicholas, with all of that detail about uh, everything that he has accomplished and seeing Dean Wood in the audience, uh, I think our recipient's about to get appointed to more committees. That's what, I, <laughs> that's what I think. Our next O'Donnell Award is in the field of silence, science. Julie Pfeffer is the recipient of the 2019 Edith and Peter O'Donnell Award in Science. 
Dr. Pfeffer holds the Kern and Marnie Wildenthal President's Research Council Professorship in Medical Science at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Now let's learn more about her work from the video. We're really interested in things that are not visible to the naked eye. And can we even study things that grow in lakes and rivers? And how can we understand these things that are so incredibly small but influence human health in such a major way? My main goal, really, and the goal of our lab is to understand how things work. And sometimes by just understanding how things work, there are whole new applications that couldn't be foreseen when you start a study. Early on in my lab, we were interested in how viruses move around the body. And that led us to ask a specific question about whether bacteria in the gut could be influencing viral infection in some way. And through a bunch of interdisciplinary collaborations, we started going down that road and very quickly found that our hypothesis that we went in with was completely wrong and that bacteria promote viral infection. So Dr. Pfeiffer's work really focuses on how bacteria in our own body can affect whether we get sick from a virus. And for a while, people had really only focused on how the virus interacts with our own body and had really forgotten about the bacteria that are in our body. This new field is just broadly kind of referred to as virus microbiota interactions or kind of trans kingdom interaction. So that created a kind of new discipline within the umbrella of microbiology because typically virologists and bacteriologists don't really talk to each other very much. And what Julie realized is that there are drugs for bacterial infections that um, can augment a viral infection. And so this was a whole new way and platform for using those types of drugs to offset the viral infection using a drug that no one even knew before you could use for this type of disease. It takes a very fearless leader to dive into fields that you're unfamiliar with. But more importantly, I think she's an incredible mentor. It's her science and the way that she trains people and the way that she relates to people in her community. She's a really valuable part of UT Southwestern and how people interact and how they collaborate and how they communicate and how they succeed. There's that best feeling in the world when you're the first person to know some scientific truth be it a simple experiment or a complex one, when you're the first person that's gonna see that result. Really what keeps us going is the fact that we're discovering new things every day. And now I'd like to invite her nominator, Dr. Kim Orth, to come forward to give some remarks about Julie. Great, thanks. I think I scooped myself. Okay, but we're gonna go forward. Um, so I'm really privileged to introduce Julie um, for this award today. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. She got her PhD at University of Michigan, and anybody who's from Michigan, she was in Ann Arbor. Um, she got her postdoc at Stanford, and she received an award there, a Damon Runyon Fellowship, which is a very prestigious award. And then we got her at UT Southwestern. She moved to UT Southwestern and she continued to accumulate more awards. She got a Pew uh, Junior Investigator Award. She's a Burroughs Welcome Foundation um, new investigator. Then recently she got a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Scholars Award. And she's a member of the American Academy of Microbiology. Julie is creative, she's clever. She's an out-of-the-box thinker. She's funny, as you all know from her talk today. And as Laura Hooper would say, she makes you laugh and blush at the same moment. <laughs> um, Julie realized that gut viruses hijack bacteria. Um, she defined a moment in medicine, um, basically providing new ideas for treatment of really nasty diseases. She also defined a new moment in science. Julie's studies resulted in the creation of a newfound field in research, stimulating national and international meetings on virus and microbial interactions. And now I confess, I work on the bacteria, 
and I probably one day will get into the viruses, but um, she's combined them both. Um, Julie is also a great mentor because of her infectious nature, um, no pun intended. She instills um, broad-based thinking and creativity into her postdocs and students. They are further enriching our scientific community because of Julie's influence. I am so honored to be a colleague of Julie, and I'm so happy that Tamis has given her this recognition. Thank you. So I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. I'd like to thank the little people. No, I'm kidding. So first, I'd like to thank Kim, my scientific fairy godmother, um, for nominating me and, and going through all of the, the steps. Um, she is emblematic of the incredibly supportive environment at UT Southwestern that has really fueled my scientific growth. Um, so in addition to lab members, which I really tried hard to highlight during my talk, who are completely inspiring and I, I get energy from on a daily basis, um, the colleagues at UT Southwestern are phenomenal and none of the work that we've done have, could have been possible anywhere else and you kind of travel around a lot and, and look at a lot of places, but I have yet to see a place as collaborative. And I think part of it is a Texas mentality, this Alamo mentality of circle the wagons, support each other, that you don't find anywhere else. And there are people on coasts that judge, sorry invited speakers from the coasts, um, but you always get these, oh, you have to go to Dallas, well, it's a phenomenal place to do science, and I am extremely privileged. So uh, I'll name a few people in addition to Kim. Uh, Laura Hooper has been a, my best friend and bi-weekly bi drinking buddy for years and is part of the reason we delved into the microbiota interactions in the first place. Um, Sebastian Winter, Nick Conrad, Yvonne Diorso, John Scoggins, innumerable people that have really inspired a lot of our work. Um, so it's a great place um, to do science and I couldn't be happier. And finally, having a really supportive family environment. Um, my parents are here. My dad is filming with Flash. <laughs> Not at all embarrassing. We call him Grandpa Razzi at home. Um, but such a supportive environment to grow up in. He is a, he is a chemist and, and getting all the support I've needed since day one. So I'm incredibly fortunate and happy to be here. Thank you. Our fourth award to celebrate today is the 2019 O'Donnell Award in Technology Innovation. Terrence Alger is the recipient of this award. He is the Director of Powertrain Engineering Division at Southwest Research Institute. Let's now learn a bit more about Dr. Alger and his work. The automobile and personal mobility is a great source of freedom people who have the ability to move around on their own enjoy something that many people in the world haven't throughout history, right? The ability to just pick up and go. Dr. Alger is one of those people that has a real passion for engines. He works tirelessly to develop new technologies to improve engine efficiencies and to greatly reduce engine emissions. Dr. Alger has been working on a concept or a technology that we call dedicated EGR. The exhaust gas from the engine is given back to the fresh air that's drawn into the engine 
cooling combustion, he built a little chemical factory into the engine, and that chemical factory is making the perfect gases for the engine to run on. We pick one or two cylinders out of the engine. We run them rich with extra fuel. It creates a tremendous amount of hydrogen and CO. Those are recirculated back into the engine with the exhaust gas from those cylinders. And we get the benefit of cool DGR with the additional benefits of the hydrogen and carbon monoxide combined. It yields an outstanding result. We get up to a 15% improvement in fuel economy in those vehicles. The challenge that engines today have is they're asked to work over a wide variety of operating conditions in extreme cold, extreme heat, very low torque, very high torque, and they have to do all that very efficiently. And currently engines right now convert about a third of the fuel energy into usable power. What we want to do is move that number up closer to half. Today, the EGR concept that he worked on early in his career has already been adopted through most of the industry. Now, the dedicated EGR concept, which is a step beyond, it's being picked up in every research lab in the world right now for engines, and announcements for production have already been made throughout much of the world. Dr. Alger is really that, that special, rare case of the crazy inventor who isn't crazy. He makes things happen. The most complex and interesting problem for combustion engineers, in my opinion, is the automotive engine. And to know that working here at our company, we were able to make a big difference in how clean and how fuel efficient cars are, even today on the road, is something that really excites me and makes me happy. I'd now like to invite to the podium his, uh, Terrence's nominator, Adam Hamilton, to make remarks. Adam? Well, thank you very much. I have the great privilege and honor of, of uh, being the president of Southwest Research Institute and having a whole host of people that are like Terry, but Terry really does stand out. As you can see from the video, he is um, a dynamo. I might call him an engine, but that might be a little too much, but uh, he is an incredible person to work with. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to TAMIST. It's a great organization. We are, such, we are very glad and honored to be participants in this evening's celebration and TAMIST as a whole. I'd also like to thank uh, members and guests, Dr. Norm Abramson. Norm, are you here tonight? Norm has been a, a great advocate of TAMIST, Southwest Research Institute Engineering, for a long time. Thank you, Norm, for all of your support. And uh, also to Peter and Edith O'Donnell for their great contributions to science, engineering, medicine, and technology. So at Southwest Research Institute, it's sometimes difficult to describe what we do. So we've taken to saying that we do everything from deep sea to deep space, from pressure holes for some of the deepest diving submarines to, you might have seen, the New Year's Day flyby of Ultima Thule, a billion miles beyond Pluto's orbit on New Year's Day just 19 days ago. But we also work on some of the toughest problems on everything in between deep sea and deep space. And Dr. Alger is one of those persons that contributes greatly, not just to the Institute, but to engineering, to different industries, and to the world. He improves humankind by making internal combustion engines more efficient, cleaner, safer, and we found out today, even faster. So I would um, also like to recognize Dr. Rab Robert Wagner, who is the director of the National Transportation Research Center, was actually the nominator for Dr. Alger. I wrote a letter of support, but uh, Dr. Wagner made the nomination, so if you see him, please thank him. He uh, was not available to be with us tonight. But uh, Terry is an incredible asset for the Institute and for all of us. At the Institute, he is seen as a leader. He's recognized for his technical contributions, but also the skills that he possesses. His personality is such that anybody can talk to him. He can explain very difficult and very technical subjects in a few charts, a few drawings, and a few analogies. He does this in a, a great way, and his leadership is appreciated and admired by those across the Institute, and particularly those that report to him. 
So Terry, I thank you for all of the contributions you've made to the Institute and that you will make to the Institute, that you make to humankind. Your work is really making a difference and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay, so just like this afternoon, I'm the last guy. Um, <laughs> just a little pro tip, uh, most people are too polite to take the microphone away, so you can actually talk as long as you want, and most people are too nice to do anything, so I hope you guys settle in. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have, uh, anyway, seriously, uh, since I am the last person, I think I should thank Dr. Daniel and the staff here at Tamas for a great evening tonight. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed it, so thank you. Um, and then, just like everybody else, I feel the need to say it. Thank you to Tamist and the O'Donnell Awards Committee and the O'Donnell family for this uh, tremendous honor. Um, it's, it's really uh, gratifying to have your accomplishments acknowledged in this way. Um, you know, when we look out there, I think many people have said it before me, but uh, innovation or bringing a new technology to the market is never something one person does. You know, oftentimes that one person becomes the face of the technology, but there's a whole slew of people behind them uh, making as important or maybe even more important contributions uh, to getting it done. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to take this time to thank, first of all, my company, Southwest Research Institute. Uh, they've been remarkably patient with allowing me to pursue my research interests and uh, uh, in funding a lot of them. Uh, so hopefully it'll pay off one day and not just in a and a metal that actually is fairly heavy. Um, I'd like to thank the University of Texas at Austin for preparing me for my career. Uh, Professor Ron Matthews and Matt Hall and DK Azacoya uh, did a great job of getting me ready to go out in the world and be a researcher. Uh, I'd like to thank the United States Army and uh, the United States Military Academy for teaching me about duty and uh, commitment. And <laughs> Um, excuse me. And last, I'd like to thank my family for being supportive. So, interestingly enough, if you knew me, you would say I'm the last person to get choked up up here. But uh, anyway, thank you very much and have a great night. Well, it's obvious that we have superstars that we've recognized, and anyone worried about the future of Texas need only look at this kind of talent and be confident about what our future uh, might have in store. Um, we'll close in just a moment, but first, I'm so pleased that the family members of the recipients are here, and no successful person uh, achieves that level of success without uh, great guidance from parents, wonderful support from spouses and companions, and understanding from children who wonder why daddy or mommy's not home or is back in the study grading papers. So let's give a round of applause, thanks, and congratulations to the family members and other supporters. All worthwhile activities take resources. These awards and the ceremony are made possible by the support of our sponsors and other contributors. We hope that you'll consider contributing and supporting TAMIST. Our staff members stand prepared to answer any questions you might have about our activities. And you can always visit our website, www.tamist.org, to find out more information and ways to support the programs that we have here. Uh, when we adjourn in a moment, I'd like to ask the uh, award recipients and nominators to stay here for a moment so we can take more pictures. And for family members, if you want to stay around, we have a highly skilled photographer available, and we'll make, be happy to make those pictures available, and not only family members, but friends or colleagues. About tomorrow morning, the breakfast line will open at 7.30. It'll be a buffet. We'll bring our breakfast in here to this room. I would ask you to be in your seat by no later than 8.10 in the morning because that's when the 
uh, talks will begin, so mark that down in your seat by no later than 8.10 tomorrow morning for some more great talks. Another fine tradition of Tamas is that in addition to enjoying food and great company, we also enjoy companionship and an open bar, which uh, will be available uh, at least for a little while or until we cut you off. So <laughs> congratulations once again, and thank you all for joining us this evening. We'll see you out in the reception area. Good evening. <laughs>